What's up, everybody? Today's episode is all about protein, the stuff you want to consider when getting a protein powder. And it's not what they tell you. They lie to you. That's what they do all the time. We don't. By the way, here's the giveaway for today's episode. MAPS Anabolic, the flagship MAPS program. I'm going to give it away to one of you viewers today. You got to do this, though. You got to leave a comment in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel and turn on your notifications. Do all those things. And if we like your comment, we'll notify you and you'll get free access to MAPS Anabolic. Also, we're running a sale right now on two other MAPS programs. MAPS Performance, this is the athlete trainer program, so it's unconventional exercises, agility, speed, strength. Um, you get some aesthetics in this, uh, in this as well, so it's like train like an athlete, look like an athlete, right? That program is 50% off. And then we have MAPS Aesthetic, this is bodybuilder style workouts, sculpt your body, build balance and symmetry, build lagging muscle groups, Get that V taper, get that sculpt that you're looking for. So that's MAPS Aesthetic. They're both 50% off. Here's what you got to do if you want to sign up for either one and get the discount. For MAPS Performance, go to mapsgreen.com. For MAPS Aesthetic, go to mapsblack.com. And then the code for both of them is FEB50. Once again, it's FEB50, no space. We'll give you 50% off MAPS Performance or MAPS Aesthetic. All right, here comes the show. All right, fellas, I think it's time we talk about the magical macronutrient. Protein. Protein. It's probably the one, I get more questions on protein, definitely more than carbs and fats. Uh, tons of questions on protein, all kinds of questions. What's the best type? When should I take it? You know, how much should I take? All that stuff. And I get it uh, because it's, well, first off, it's an essential macronutrient, meaning you you have to eat protein in your diet in order just to survive. Same thing with fat. Carbs are not essential, but proteins are very important, but also for athletic performance and muscle building, right? Um, high protein diets have been clearly connected to faster muscle growth, better recovery, and better performance in, in, in most sports. Um, and it's probably one of the most, if not the most popular supplement that people would ever take. Would you say it's the most under-consumed macronutrient? Uh, average average person yeah. probably yeah. yeah just in general yeah. right like uh, it's definitely not carbs carbs is definitely not the yeah, most no. <laughs> under we're not we're not at it it's usually the most appealing for yeah people carbs yeah. that's pretty good too so I think that a lot of people get plenty of that I think it's the most uh, probably under eaten uh, macronutrient that we have yeah I would agree I would say I mean because studies are pretty clear that a eating more protein tends to result in um, more satiety so you tend to eat less calories. Now, to be clear, uh, we're really in a, uh, you know, in, a, in a situation here where everybody eats too much of everything, so there's just too many calories overall. But yeah, if we were to like reduce calories, then you'd have to bump. You'd want to bump protein up, right? That would help with that. Um, but yeah, I, I think we should tackle protein and the most important things to consider when buying a protein powder um, and talk about things like the, you know, the, the anabolic window and kind of you know, how important or not important it is and you know, things along those lines. Yeah, and I think, too, there's just a lot of misconceptions in terms of, like, uh, you, you talked about the magical macronutrient. I think that people still out there think that, uh, you know, more is better. And my mic's you know, obviously <laughs> not working with me today. <laughs> just the first time. <laughs> <laughs> I got so nervous. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, we all kind of went through that phase of just uh, trying to get bigger. And so you think that you have to have like an enormous amount of protein to be able to make that happen. Well, we, we talk on the show right about we've all shared many different times, um, you know, pivotal moments in our lifting career that like, that that one tweak or that one thing you learn yeah. that completely like shifted your your training or your physique uh, th hitting my protein intake was one of the single most important things that ever like came all together for me yeah when do you remember the first time it really made sense yeah well i mean i i remember it was the first time i really started tracking to be honest, I I kind of assumed that I ate enough protein. So I was buying protein shakes and bars before I was even tracking my protein. So there, you know, as a young kid who started lifting when I was around 17, introduced to supplements, um, I took protein powders and and bars like uh, they were made for building muscle, right? Yeah, like they, yeah. you, you just taking those while lifting, that's supposed to yeah. not really grasping the concept of, you know, yeah. my body needs a certain amount of protein. Yeah, total intake, yeah. right? Yeah, like I wasn't thinking like that. So I was buying and eating protein powder and, and bars for a long time before I actually tracked and realized, 
holy shit, even when I have a protein bar or shake every day, I'm still grossly under consuming my protein intake. And when I actually started to target the right amount, it was huge difference. Yeah. I mean, for, I started to I started to pack on muscle relatively quick right after that. Yeah, that's just the same thing I did. I, I took I started taking supplements real young. I, I I was working real young, so I had money. So and I started working out at fourteen. So by the time fourteen and a half or so, I would buy supplements and, and weight gainers and protein powders were always on the list, and it was always real tough to gain. Right, I was a kind of your classic ectomorph. And then there was a summer where I lived with my grandparents because my parents went to Italy for vacation. And my grandma, I've told this story before, but she's, you know, old school Italian grandma. Asked you what you would you want to eat. She'll, she'll make me whatever I want, yeah. right? That was her favorite thing to do is just make me what do you want. And so I'm like, oh. Steak. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, no, I like steak. So I had steak, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Like she just made it for me all the time. And I remember I built so much muscle and strength in that summer. And then I started to think like, you know, I think I'm eating high protein. What I used to consider high protein would be like, Oh, I had a sandwich and it had turkey and cheese in it, right? right. So that's got to have protein in it. Or I had a handful of nuts. There's some protein in it. But in reality, you know, I was 100 and probably at the time, 165 pounds, 160 pounds. And I, the goal would be to eat about 160 grams of protein a day. I was probably consuming closer to 70, yeah. mm -hmm. to be quite honest. So when I went back and started really paying attention, I said, okay, I need 160 grams of protein. If I'm eating breakfast, lunch, and dinner, I need to have like 40 grams of protein for each and then add a shake. Yeah. And then I'll hit that number. Once I started doing that, it made a huge, a huge difference. Well, even then too, and I bring that up is like a lot of like seeking a lot of protein, but what I was actually consuming was the majority of it was carbohydrates and, and fat and everything else I was putting into the shakes. So it wasn't necessarily that I was getting a lot of uh, the quality protein that I needed to uh, hit my daily targets. It was just, I was consuming yeah. a whole lot of everything to try and make that happen. I found this with, to be true for my clients too. Um, and, and I think they all fell into the similar trap as I did, which is, oh, I eat sandwiches or, oh, I eat meat. Right. And if I don't, I make sure I get a protein bar or yeah. a shake. And so like the way, you know, they are computing it is like, oh yeah, I'm always eating protein. I never don't, I never have a day where I don't eat yeah. protein. Yeah. I had some cheese for lunch. Right. So, and that. those are all like anything that had any protein in it, you were kind of counting as a protein meal. And when you, I would get them to actually start tracking. Yep. What we would find out, just like what you said, Sal, is you know their target may be 150 to 180 grams of protein, and they're eating more like 50 to 70, like, and not realizing how how many how many thing or how many ounces of meat or how many shakes or bars they would need to consume in order to hit that target, and then they hit that target consistently. Because then the next phase of this for me was, okay, now I'm aware that I was grossly under consuming it. Now I'm going to start paying attention and tracking. And even when I would, I was really paying attention, what I found I would do is I'd have a couple good days and then I'd have two, three <laughs> bad days in a row. And so it So then your average sucked. Yeah. So then my, my, my overall average, again, the, it, once I got to a point where I was like, okay, this is going to be, and this is also why this is uh, typically some of our first advice that we give to anybody, right? Is just focus on protein first. Just yeah. make sure you're hitting the, the right amount. And this is, you know, this is where I see shakes and bars have tremendous value. Although we're always promoting getting your, your, your uh, protein from whole foods, yeah. which is a good goal to have. The reality of it is many times you're going to come short of that. And so it helps to have even, even if things. you're the, like, um, you know, let's, even if you're someone who's kind of, you know, let's say you're a 120 pound, 130 pound woman, you know, for, and by the way, optimal protein intake for your goals is different than, uh, the essential amount that you need to survive. Right. So you don't need as much protein as we're advocating just to be okay. There's nothing wrong with eating 60 grams of protein a day. Right. But if your goal is to be, get leaner, build more muscle, faster recovery, uh, have more satiety. Uh, so if you're, if you're cutting calories, protein is great for satiety. Then the studies are pretty clear that you want to have about 0.7 grams of protein per body weight or what people tend to do is aim for one gram per pound of body weight. So 120, 130 pound female, 100 grams of protein would be plenty for her. But even that, if you show a 120 pound or 130 pound woman, you know, 30 grams of protein for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Yeah, that's three. That's three meals. She's eating a six ounce chicken breast. Yeah, or who does how many that? eggs would you need to eat? Right, yeah. to get 30 grams. Most people, I like, oh, have two eggs in the morning. Right, that's 12 grams. Yeah, you need more like eight to 10, something like that. Right. Yeah. So a lot of people just don't have that kind of understanding or concept. So, but if you eat optimal amounts of protein. The studies are pretty conclusive uh, that you will get better and faster um, results. So that's kind of what we're talking about here. Now, protein is probably one, I would say, 
probably one of the first supplements ever sold. If I if, if you go back into supplement history, some of the first supplements ever sold or marketed were either a, a, some kind of a protein powder, like a non-fat dry milk type mix, or some kind of an amino acid supplement, which is what proteins are was made up Ovaltine, of. Ovaltine, Weeder, well, who's first? Oh God, there was even before that. No, oh, wow. Yeah, there, there were companies that were even older and they were protein based because even then people kind of understood, or at least people in the, the, the strength sports understood that protein was important. So because it's been around for so long as a supplement, the marketing around protein uh, has existed for a long time. And a lot of money is poured into the marketing because you can look at protein and say, well, it's, you know, 10 grams is 10 grams is 10 grams. And they said, no, there's differences. But then they went really far and talked about, you know, how quickly this releases amino acids and whether or not this is a better one to take at night or in the morning or post-workout or before your workout. or And there's lots of marketing surrounding protein, which only confuses people. It really does. Because what it does is it gets people to focus on the wrong things. Um, there are a few things, key things you should focus on when it comes to protein powder, not necessarily the protein from your food. If you can get it all from food, that's ideal. Okay, that's 100% ideal. If you never had to take a protein powder, that's perfect because your diet's so good. But if you're like most of us, it's hard to get the amount of protein that you know would be optimal for your goals. You're probably going to throw in some kind of a convenient powder, in which case you you know a lot of people are like, well, what's the best protein powder? Is it the cheapest? Is it the one that says is the fastest absorbing or the one that's the slowest absorbing? This one says it's more anabolic than this one. Like, what's the best type of protein? So what we did is we listed the factors that you should consider um, when buying a protein powder in order of importance. And these are the factors that we've identified over two decades of training people. Okay. So when you're, when you train people for a long period of time, you start to see trends and you start to realize what's really important and what's really not as important. And the first thing I have to say, that's probably the most, it's definitely the most important factor when considering a protein powder has nothing to do with all the stuff that they market with the amino acids and how quickly it's really, you know, releasing all that stuff. That's mm -hmm. not nearly as important as this one thing right here, which is how well do you digest oh, this protein? This is a massive factor. Huge. I mean, because we can all remember the, um, even if it's just coming from like a, a shake source, like a whey protein, sometimes, you know, for some people, you know, they, they have like an intolerance. Uh, so that's a major, they can't like physically keep that down and, and, and digest it well. Uh, so we have to eliminate that as a possibility right away. And I know that there's a lot of different sources of protein that just don't agree with people. And so why go through the pain and suffering of it uh, if it's not working for well, your body? And a lot of people don't even realize that. Yep. Like, uh, I mean, I was guilty of this also. I it's remember. so accepted. They call it protein farts. Yeah. I mean, and that's it. So by the way, if you're listening to this and you don't think you have a dairy intolerance or you don't think you have any issues with whey at all, but when you have like a whey protein, if you're t having to take a shit 15 minutes later, or you if know, you fart and it's terrible, yeah, it, uh, <laughs> it's yeah. probably if some after you have that protein shake, clearing. you're you're farting uncontrollably all night long. This is not just like a normal thing, but we have normalized it in the in the you know workout bodybuilding space. You know, people just call them protein farts. Like it's like this, it's like dude, when someone when it smells like someone crawled up there and died, this is not a normal thing. And there's probably a better protein powder for you than the one you're currently using, dude. This took me so long to figure out because I thought this is, oh, yeah, that's what happens when you eat protein powders. You sometimes get diarrhea. You sometimes fart really bad <laughs> yeah. and your stomach It's all part blows. of the process, right? So this is a problem because I don't care how great your protein powder looks on paper. If it's affecting your digestion uh, negatively, inflammation goes up, stress hormones go up, uh, stress hormones counter the anabolic muscle building hormones. Um, you're more bloated, less likely to be able to eat healthy, which cause also, by the way, bloat and digestive issues causes weird cravings. You may crave other types of foods. Um, it's just not a conducive uh, state of being for fitness, for muscle building, for performance, or for fat loss. Your protein powder should be, by the way, let's, let's break this down for a second. Protein powder is protein that's been pre-digested and dried. Okay, so it's been put into a powder form. Technically, it should be easier to digest than if it was in food form. Okay, mm -hmm. so if the protein powder is harder for you to digest than food, it's the wrong powder for you. You yeah. should drink protein powder and feel like, like you drank water. It's th that's how well you digest it. If it doesn't feel that way, you need to find yourself another source of protein because it doesn't matter what that protein is. If your digestion is negatively affected, 
it is harming your gains. It is not helping right. your gains. It's not a uh, it's not a, a side effect that has no co- no no effects. Right. It's there's lots of effects from the side effect. There's all kinds of carryover from that, and then eating your follow up meals preceding that. It makes everything difficult, especially you know if the goal is to build muscle and to stay in a surplus, it's going to make that very difficult and challenging for you if you don't have a good digestible uh, protein source to begin with. Yeah. Now, what are what are the most common offenders as far as like pro- uh, protein powders? Like when you in your experience. What protein powders do people tend to have the most issues with and which ones are the, the most easily digestible? Well, wow, that's a tough one because it's very different. So some people with whey, it's so easy to digest. And whey has some very incredible studies supporting it for gut health. Now, there's a caveat here. If you can't digest dairy very well like me, it's terrible for gut health. For me, whey would be terrible. But in, in some kids, whey is high in branched amino acids and glutamine, which can also help repair the gut and feed beneficial bacteria. And so there's studies that show that whey helps people with gut issues, but only if they can digest uh, dairy well. Um, Egg protein, right? Uh Egg protein powders, by the way, egg protein powders used to be the gold standard before whey. Egg protein is incredible. I mean, it's the uh, branched amino acids in it are high. It's this complete protein, right? It's supposed to be really good. Some people digest it really well. You talk to other people taking an egg protein powder, oh, that, and it's the worst farts of all that time. That did not resonate well with me. <laughs> I tried that for a while, and it just, yeah, I was suffering uh, and just bloat and gas like all day long. So. Yeah. And then there's casein, which is a type of uh, dairy protein. Also, if you, can di- if you can't digest protein, uh, excuse me, dairy very well, it's not going to work well for you. Soy, for some people, works well. For other people, not so much. Bone broth proteins tend to be the most easily digestible for most people, um, but I'm sure there's someone out there that, you know, so it's one of those things or that you have to There's like a beef isolate now? Yeah, or? there's beef isolate now, right? Which should be pretty easy to digest for, for most people. Um, although I've had beef isolates that didn't work very well either. So the best, the, the here's where I would say to start. Start with your known food intolerances and then, okay, oh, so I have an intolerance to egg or I have an intolerance to dairy. Probably don't want to get a protein source, a protein powder from those sources. Yeah. Start there. Buy a small... Uh, you know, container of it, test it out. And if you notice gastro issues, okay, I got to move on to another protein. Once you find one that works for you, uh, that's great. But mm-hmm. digestibility has got to be on the top. And if you have digest any kind of digestive is- issues from your protein powder, you got to dump it and move on to it. Now, what's else. your thought? This is a little off topic, but then, but selfishly, I want to know. Um, so I noticed that I can, I can do a whey protein shake so long as that's that's pretty much it for the day. But if I have like, let's say a magic spoon and I have a protein powder and then maybe I do cheese or milk or oh, something, yeah. then I have an issue. So uh, would you say that I have an intolerance for that or do I just have a threshold? And so, so, yeah. long, so long as I stay within that range, I should be fine. I- yeah, you have a you have an intolerance and the way intolerances can sometimes work is there's a threshold. So like I can have some bread, but if I eat too much bread, then it starts to bother me. Or I can have some dairy. and it's So even me, with uh, I have a really bad intolerance to dairy. I can do a little bit of cheese and be okay. Yeah. Not nearly as much as you can. Definitely yeah. not as much as Justin. Yeah, cheese doesn't bother me at all. Like yeah. I, I have it on a pretty regular basis. But I, I what I've noticed is if all the like cheese, yeah. magic spoon, and a whey protein, and let's say like a, even like a whey bar or something like that, that in one day is enough to mess me up. Yeah. But I, I seem to be able to get away with some. So what I try and do is I try and keep a, you know, I use the Organifi vegan protein, and then I have the whey, and then I just try and- Oh, depending on what you did during the day. Yeah. Yeah, so then that I makes just, sense. Then I try and, because I like whey better. I mean, let's be honest, whey tastes better. Like most whey proteins taste really good. So I prefer the whey, but I also know that if I've had other w- yeah. whey or dairy in my diet in the day, that 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 shake could yeah. potentially mess my stomach up. Yeah. The, the next thing you should look at is the quality of the protein powder. Now, because the protein powder market is so huge, and it was already big, right? It was already the majority of the supplement market in the 70s, 80s, early 90s, and then whey protein hit the market, and whey was... Uh, for, for many people, it was easy to digest. It was very inexpensive. Uh, it was easy to mix, right? If you have a good protein, whey protein powder, you can do it in a shaker cup, no clumps or whatever. And designer, I remember designer protein was one of the first ones uh, to come out to do that. It really blew up the market. And then you had all these people come into the market. And, and protein powders even today have a really small margin. They're not super profitable because it's so competitive. And so what a lot of people do with protein powders is they look at the price because they'll say, well, this says whey. 
that says way. This one is cheaper. I'm going to go with that one. And they don't pay attention to the quality because they think it's all the same, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, this is egg protein. That's egg protein. It's the same. This one's cheaper. I'm going to go with that one. But we have studies now that are pretty clear that show that quality makes a huge difference. For example, it was a while ago where they it, they discovered there was a comp there was a company which if one company got discovered doing this, but lots of them were doing this. When they get their products tested, the way you test to see what protein content is in protein powders, you test a specific amino acid, right? So you'll test, for example, let's say leucine. And if there's so much leucine per serving, then you extrapolate and say, well, then there's so many grams of protein per this powder. Okay, it looks like you have 30 grams of protein per serving. Like you say, you're all good. Well, what these companies did is they did what's called amino acid spiking. So they would put less protein than the label says. So it says 30 grams, but it's maybe 15, so they could save money. Then they throw in some cheap amino acid that, know, that they knew that was going to get tested so that the machine would then extrapolate. It's got more protein than it did. That's called amino acid spiking. There was a company that got caught doing that. They went out of business, and other companies have been also seen doing this as well. So that's one way where quality uh, makes a big difference. Another way, and this was uh, when we first started Mind Pump. Do you guys remember that study that came out that tested- oh, The heavy metal study? Yeah, dude. Yeah. They tested vegan sources of protein and found them to be well above the threshold of heavy metals, which, which is toxic not Toxic and problematic uh, You know, if you're consuming that. So it's, it's, it's just one of those things. You got to know that quality plays a factor in a lot more ways than uh, you, you anticipate going into it. Totally. The other game, and I don't know if you're going to relate this to quality or not, but the, the serving size- where they yeah. manipulate that. I, this was like one of the biggest hurdles I always had to deal with with clients is I had a few protein brands back in the days that I liked working with and um, I knew it was good quality. I knew it was high protein. And so I'd recommend to clients and it, you know, at least one out of every 10 clients would come back with, you know, some generic brand that they found because they found it for half the price. And they'd be mm -hmm. like, Oh yeah, I, I got a protein, but I got this one from CVS or I got this one from yeah, this, Walmart. Yeah. I Walmart know, or whatever like that for, you know, a quarter of the price or like that. And then I'd have them bring it in and then I'd flip the jar around. I don't have to explain to them like, yeah, you understand this thing's only got, 12 grams of protein per serving. So you got to have two to three times the serving just to equate to one of these servings. And That's then when why you, the bag's so big. Yeah. And not only that, but then when you do the math at the end of it, it's like you literally went out of your way to save like $2 maybe, you know, and, and on top of that, I don't know what, how good of quality this protein powder that is, doesn't have any sort of third party, third party testing behind it. So all, all in the name of saving $3, you thought you were saving $30 cause that was the difference of the jug, but you have to, factor in the serving size and the amount of you're, you're paying for the amount of grams of protein in the serving. Yeah. So you got to pay attention to that. And some, some of these places will, will make you feel like you're getting way more, but then the serving size is only 12 grams of protein when your, your standard scoop is like 24 to 30 or yeah, whatever. I remember you even, you even worked in a place that, uh, didn't you help package protein yeah, yeah, powder? Yeah. I, it was actually, I remember, it was designer. And I remember you telling me that they didn't, yeah. they didn't there was no like accurate measurement. Yeah, no, we were, we were in high school. So we were high school kids and we worked <laughs> at a, so back then, uh, like a company like design designer Hershey actually went through there too. Like, they they pay a, a mixing company and so I worked for the mixing company. Mm. So we did we mixed all kinds of stuff, like all all different types of powders and stuff. And at that time I was working out, so I recognized the brand designer when it came. But you have a bunch of high school kids responsible for you know, one and a half, three scoops, four scoops. You know what I'm saying? Like we just mixed it all in there. It wasn't really, <laughs> I don't know how accurate it was a lot of times. And nobody was, you know, double checking our work. Yeah. It's not a regulated market. Um, so there's some good with that. You get a lot of new products, a lot of new uh, brands or whatever, but also places more responsibility on the consumer. Mm -hmm. um, I think the most important thing you, you got to look for is third party testing for impurities because although I would be pissed if I knew that what I was taking was 15 grams of protein instead of, you know, 30, like I thought. That wouldn't make me nearly as mad as knowing that I've been developing, you know, building up toxic levels of heavy metals, which can cause mm -hmm. all kinds of strange effects in the body. Autoimmune issues, all kinds of things. Autoimmune issues, uh, neurological issues, uh, hormonal issues, cancers. And then you don't know that, oh, it's this protein powder I've been taking for seven or eight years every single day after my workout. So look for third party testing for is it pure? Are there heavy metals? Are there toxins? Um, because, like I said, they did a study. Um, and maybe we'll find it. We'll post it up. But they literally tested. I don't remember how many brands of, of vegan proteins. I think it was like 10 or 7. Almost all of them. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like one. A lot of big name brands. Too. Yes. It wasn't like one had too much. It was almost all of them. There's other studies, not on protein powders, but on other supplements where they went and tested. I forgot what it was like, 12 
companies and they and I think like a majority of them had none of what they said they had on nothing at all yeah Yeah. so you know keep that in mind when you're so quality makes a big difference and price tells you something about quality usually not everything but usually the more expensive brand there's a reason why it's a little bit more expensive if it's been around but look for that third party well, test. And uh, was it examine.com does a good job of like kind of rating and reviewing yeah. a lot of these brands yep. just to give well, you insight. That's why it's more expensive. So because it's not regulated, technically these supplement companies don't have to do third party testing. Yeah. And when they do have to do third party testing, they got to pay an extra fee they in do. order to do that. So that's so right away that's I mean that should be your first if it's the cheapest protein powder on the shelf, Right away, I'd be concerned just because they're more than likely they're they're cutting corners with things like that. Yeah, I agree. All right, so the next factor that's important, uh, and some of you're going to probably scoff, but it's definitely important, is the flavor. Hell this is, yes. This oh, is oh, now. Oh, look, oh, I, now this is coming from someone who could care less. What pro, I, I've been. It's coming from the bone broth. Guy. I've been I've been blending <laughs> stuff. Over oh, here. dude, I've been blending things and drinking things since I was a kid. I made chicken breast uh, smoothies and tuna fish smoothies and weird shit. <laughs> And I don't care. I'll just swallow it. Doesn't matter. But uh, I, for my clients, if they didn't like the flavor of whatever protein powder they were taking, they wouldn't take it. It was just, it didn't matter. I don't care what else was great about it. They just didn't take it. If you dread drinking your protein powder, yeah, uh, because How long of the you taste, stick with that. You're just at not that gonna, point. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's a valid behavioral point. It's like if if you're if you're like dreading taking this this protein and, and implementing it into your routine, it's just one of those things that's going to be the first thing to just cut its way out. Well, yeah. by the way, this is this had a lot to do with why we ended up working with Organifi too, because we're there. We know there's lots of people like Sal who can't handle whey. Whey typically is your best. Like there's not a lot of, there's not a lot of whey brands that don't have good flavors. I'd say like most companies. They've done a pretty good job with whey. Yeah, they've done it, especially now. By now, most protein powders that are whey based are pretty good. It's hard to find a vegan based protein that tastes Usually good. Usually they taste like uh, grass and dirt yeah, or chalk. chalk. Yes. Yeah. And mm-hmm. and that was one of the things. I mean, I before Organifi, I wouldn't even mess with it. I would just tough out the 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 way I felt when I would do the way or do my best of not having to use a protein uh, shake at all. So they were the first ones that I liked that were actually vegan powders. So yeah. it makes a now, big now, when it comes to flavors, what to pick, I'd say generally chocolate is going to be better than the other flavors. I think it's the easiest one for them to taste to make taste the best. Mm-hmm. Vanilla would be second. Vanilla is good because you could blend it with other things. Yeah, it's good to mix yeah. vanilla with just about anything. Now, my experience with protein powders is this. If it's any other flavor, especially if it's a fruit flavor like strawberry, it's probably gross. I've almost never <laughs> found like a strawberry flavored protein powder that actually tastes pretty good. And I like strawberry shakes. So when I was a kid, I would always take a chance and just be like, oh, it's gross. But chocolate is probably your best bet. I don't know. Do you guys? I'm vanilla. I'm vanilla because then I mix, right? You so do the, yeah. my favorite thing to do is to get a, whether you're doing a whey or you're doing like an Organifi vegan protein, but get a, a, a vanilla flavor because it goes with just about anything. So I can make it a either like a, a tardy, like strawberry banana type of shake, or I can go like a peanut butter chocolate direction, and vanilla works great yeah, with both I'm of those. Peanut butter chocolate. Where guy. chocolate, you're, you're not going to mix chocolate with um, you know strawberries or blueberries or something like that. It just doesn't go very yeah. well. So vanilla for me is my favorite, and then I use fruit and stuff to like change, you know, to mix it up yeah. a little bit so I get something different. Yeah, now, speaking of mixing it, this is actually quite important. I would hear, again, this is coming from someone who could care less. I would dry scoop protein powder. This is no joke. That's a really hard thing to do, by the way. But I had uh, you know, clients, if they had a protein powder that didn't mix well in a shaker cup, they wouldn't take it. And you know, people will tell you, nothing worse than drinking protein powder and hitting a clump of dry powder. <laughs> Not all protein powders mix really well. Some you have to have a blender, which makes it less convenient. Remember, I think the, the number one factor that makes protein powders valuable is their convenience. They, they store for a long period of time. You can take them with you anywhere. They don't need a refrigerator or anything like that. They don't go bad for a while. And then you just throw them in a shaker cup and mix them up. Well, if you lose some of the convenience, you tend to lose some of the consistency when it comes to uh, protein powders. The best mixing protein powders tend to be whey. Again, mm-hmm. this is why it's so popular. I think one of the reasons why they're so popular Vegan protein powders, a little bit more difficult, although Organifi, again, not so bad. Um, egg protein doesn't really mix super well. Casein, typically you need a, a blender. Casein, I noticed when I mix that without a blender, it's, thick. 
it gets out. Yeah, it gets really thick. It's interesting to see too how it, you know it's evolved uh, in trying to you know improve that with those little like spongy balls that they put in there yeah. to like shake and mix or oh, like yeah. other you know sort of innovations in that direction. But at the end of the day, there are protein powders that just don't tend to blend well. Yeah, no, no, I agree. no, not at all. And now this next one is uh, kind of last, but it's 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 important, but it's last for a reason. It's because the other stuff that we just talked about really de- it really is a stronger determinant on whether or not somebody will use a protein consistently and gain benefit from it. But this last one is what people think is going to be the most important for them, and that's the amino acid profile or the score. You know, is it how bioavailable is it? This protein has got more leucine than this protein, or this one's got more branching amino acids. This one's got more glutamine. This one's going to be, you know, better for building muscle. In a study, head to head comparison, 15 grams of this protein, spiked protein synthesis, 15% more than this one. Here's why that doesn't matter that much. Okay. It does matter, but not that much. It doesn't matter that much when your protein intake is really high. So when they do studies on protein and they compare them head to head, if protein intake is below that threshold that we talked about earlier in the episode, you know, that 0.7 to 1 gram per pound of body weight, if your protein intake is low, then the amino acid score makes a big difference, right? If you're only eating 60 grams of protein a day, then it makes a difference if is it coming from whey or is it coming from soy, for example. The whey is going to kick the crap out of uh, the soy, right? Animal sources tend to be much better. But if your protein intake is high, if you're eating a gram of protein per pound of body weight, you're getting so much of the amino acids that you need the score doesn't make that big of a difference, and then you see that it kind of negates it. Well, remember how we started this conversation. I mean, that this was this was the most pivotal thing that I ever did was just hit my intake. Yeah. Was, I, I couldn't even tell you what protein powder or bar I was using at that time. I think the most important thing to focus on because you're right. That's this is the marketing side. Yep. This is what they because it is so competitive. This is how protein powders will try and separate themselves from from their peers. But the truth is. You just hitting your your protein intake every day, like that should be the main focus. Whether you do it through Whole Foods or you use a protein shake or not, you you check off that box, then all this other stuff is splitting hairs. Yeah, totally. So now if your protein intake isn't super high, um, then this starts to make more of a difference, right? Animal sources are superior to plant sources, mainly because they have a, a more favorable amino acid profile. They don't lack any essential amino acids. So when you look at protein, it's made up of amino acids. And the essential amino acids are called essential because your body can't make them. So if it lacks an essential amino acid, well, then you're limited to how much of that protein you can use based off of that that limiting factor. Vegan sources, singular vegan sources, sometimes don't have very good amino acid profiles. This is why if you go with a vegan source of protein, combinations tend to be best. So if you look at the, the back, you'll see... Mm-hmm. Oh, it's got some pea protein. It's got some quinoa protein. It's got some soy. It's got some whatever. A combination usually means that there's complementary amino acid profiles from each of these different sources, giving you a more complete type of protein. With the animal sources, you don't need that, right? I can have just a whey or just egg or just beef or just casein, and I'm going to have a pretty decent amino acid uh, profile. I don't have to worry too much about combining you know, the, the different uh, types of protein now, sources. Now, even, even that being said, this is still kind of splitting hairs, right? I mean, as far as the difference, like even like, let's say we are low protein. Let's say I my body, I'm only consuming 90 grams. And, and I you're have, what, 220 pounds? Yeah, right. right. So that's you know, half, right? Half of what I should probably be eating. And I have the option of a vegan protein or whey. Yes, it's better to go whey, but is it, is it like how detrimental are we talking about? Is it, it actually makes a pretty big difference. When, and they, when it's low like that. Yeah, when it's low, it makes a pretty big difference. So you'll see in studies, uh, like they'll show a difference in strength and muscle. Now, is it like you know, you know, ten pounds a month? No, but over the course of a year, two years, it does make a difference. So this is why. So when I would have clients that were vegan, for example, um, and I would have them, uh, you know, supplement. I'd have them supplement with essential amino acids. So because some of them had low protein and they didn't, they they had no interest in bumping their protein up anymore. Mm-hmm. Even if I talked to them, they're like, I don't care, Sal. I'm getting enough. I feel fine. So I'd say, hey. Why don't you take these essential amino acid pills with your vegan meals? And what that would do is potentially supplement the amino acids that they may not be getting from the vegan it. source. And they got great benefits from that. But if the protein is high, it really doesn't yeah. make uh, that Now, in a terms of like what a lot of people consider as well as like the timing of everything. Should yeah. I get it like right after my workout? Should I get it first thing in the morning? Okay. Like when's the most optimal time to synthesize protein? There is a benefit to taking protein post-workout, but it's not what you think. Okay, so- 
is there this magical anabolic muscle building window where if I take 30 grams of protein post-workout, it's going to build more muscle than if I took that same 30 grams later in the day or earlier in the day? And they've done meta analysis on this, and the answer is no. It does not make a difference whether you take it right after or you take it later. But I still see a benefit post-workout in this sense. If we're talking about the average person who tends to struggle getting protein intake in, it's a great way to ritualize an additional 30 grams of protein. It's consistent, and it's usually not a meal time. So it's usually in between lunch and dinner or after dinner or before they eat breakfast. So rather than, than them having to add more protein to their meals, which can sometimes be hard, if I what I would tell clients is, hey, right after your workout, it's really convenient, it's in your gym bag, shake up 30 grams of protein, and it just became an additional 30 grams of protein that they would have throughout the day. That would be, yeah. that would be the benefit that I would So say. if you've listened to the show long enough, you probably remember me talking about that. When we first addressed the anabolic window, I shared how I would do this, but yeah. my intentions were what you just said. It would, and it would always be when I'm in on a bulk. When I'm on a cut, I'm not really worried about it. In fact, when I'm on a cut, I would take advantage of trying not to eat right after a workout and actually string that out longer so I was eating less calories. But when I was trying to increase calories and increase my protein intake, uh, that helped because right after a workout, I could shake it up. I could drink it on the drive home. By the time I got home, I showered. I was already ready for like a big meal and I'd be okay. So then I just got that, I shuttled that 30 grams of protein in right before I have another 30 to 40 yeah. gram protein meal, which helped me hit my protein intake. That's where I see value with timing there. That's about that that type of person who's struggling to get there. The only other place I see the most where the most value with protein shakes is at the end of the day. At the end of the day, assessing did I get enough protein in the day, making there's, and then making up the difference. Yeah, there's this I, there's this mistake that you know I, that I made as a kid that many clients have made also with this idea that taking a protein shake or bar, there's something about it that builds muscle or it's not that at all. And it's not, you don't, just because you're on a, a routine, like, oh, I'm starting my workout routine. All of a sudden I just start taking a shake or bar. That's kind of a silly way to use it. What you should do is first assess where is my protein intake at? What does a normal day look like for me? And then go, oh, wow, I tend to fall around this much. Mm -hmm. I need this much. And then again, even knowing that my goal for clients always is let's try and get that through whole foods. But I know and, and, and understand because I've gone through this myself, which sometimes it's still tough to do that. And then that's where I would pile it on at the end of the night. Like, oh, wow, I'm still 30 grams short of my my daily intake, and so then I'd be mixing up a shake. 100%. And I see more benefit to people struggling to hit calories and protein than, than anything else. 100%. Uh, but yeah, you see a lot of the marketing where they're like, um, you know, this protein digests faster, therefore take it post-workout. This one digests slower. Take it right before you go to bed. I remember when they sold that with casein. Casein is a slow-release protein. Mm -hmm. Take it before bed so your muscles have protein all night long. One of the worst times to eat, by the way, is right before you go to bed, Even whether it's a shake or food. So that's just out the way. Whatever benefit, where well, there is none, by the way, but let's just say there was a tiny benefit, is gone because of the-, the, the Now you're the, interrupting your sleep. It decreases the quality of your sleep, and sleep is extremely important uh, to building muscle and, and burning body fat and all that stuff. So forget the the timing and the you know which one releases amino acids faster and this and that and the other. No, no, no. The stuff we just listed is literally the most important stuff to pay attention to. And still, if you can get all your protein from whole natural foods, you're going to be better off, 100%. Look, if you like our information, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out our guides. We have guides that can help you with almost any fitness or health goal. You can also find all of us on social media. So Justin is on Instagram at mindpumpjustin. Adam is on Instagram at mindpumpadam. And I'm on Twitter at mindpumpsal.